too miked. Yeah. So, verse 2. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever, but whatever, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you and you, Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The big storyline of the Bible is that God created all things. And then he crowned his creation by creating man, male and female. He made them in his image to know perfect fellowship, to rule and order his creation perfectly. Man rebelled. His relationship with God was broken. His relationship with man was broken, man to man. And man's relationship with himself even was broken by this rebellion, by sin. And the Bible tells us that the whole world was broken. The whole world came under a curse. All of creation was damaged by this broken personal relationship. And then even at the very beginning, God hints at his promise in Genesis 3 that he will one day send a redeemer who will reconcile his people to himself. That he will forgive the sins of his people. That he will bring them together And that he will make all creation one day new in such a way even that it will be unbreakable. So when Jesus sends out his 72 followers to the towns of Israel in pairs, he sends them to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near to them. An intriguing thing. This is the summary of what we're to know they preached. I'd really like the full manuscript. Tell me everything you said. This this was really a powerful uh, time. And it begs the question... We would ask, what would you expect to see if the kingdom of God really invaded our world? What would you expect to see? Would you expect to see armies, brand new governments, whole new budgets and systems of operating? Would it start from the top down? That's usually the most effective. How would it look? And that's that's kind of the question I think our text is begging us to ask. Um, And it's the question that Luke is asking. When Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God, he did things that no one expected. If they'd read the Bible more carefully, we look back and say they should have expected some of these things. But it was all quite a shock. He proclaimed first he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises of God. It got their attention. He taught and read the scriptures in the synagogues and then out on the streets and in the villages. He healed people. He didn't say that's why he came. He came to preach the kingdom of God, but he healed people to demonstrate that. And earlier in Luke, we have an interesting story that really uh, brings the issue to a head. Jesus is teaching in a house, 
and the place is so crowded that the street is filled with people and as always people know about what's going on with Jesus and a group of men have brought a paralyzed man on a stretcher so that their friend can be healed but they can't get anywhere near him so they get on the roof somehow pull away the uh, um, uh, the roof tiles and lower him down in front of Jesus and Jesus is impressed and he looks at uh, looks at the situation, he looks at this man uh, um, paralyzed, a quadriplegic there in front of him, and he says, man, your sins are forgiven. Uh, and the, uh, the religious leaders who are in the crowd listening are incensed, they're enraged. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus knows what they're thinking, and he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, I say to this man, take your mat, roll it up, get up and go home. And he did demonstrated who he was. Begging the question, who is this man who can forgive sins, what only God can do? Jesus taught his followers things that weren't entirely new, but things that weren't being practiced in Israel. He, he, they came together as a community that was entirely different. He taught them to be generous, giving people. Because he said, you're now the children of God. You've inherited everything. All the riches of the heavenly realms are yours. You can afford to be generous. He taught them to forgive, which was an Old Testament teaching, but it wasn't being understood and followed. He taught them to take it to the, to the full degree. Love your enemies, he said. Forgive people who really, really hurt you, and they're not repentant about it. Even your enemies. He said, suffer for doing the right thing without complaining. Consider it a privilege. And when his followers, who heard his message of grace, and recognized that their sins were forgiven, were able to live like this, it changed the world. Generally, the poor flocked to Jesus, while the rich and the powerful stayed away. There were some, there were some very pleasant exceptions to that. But... That was generally what was going on. So much so that the rich and the powerful eventually plotted and, uh, and executed his murder. Jesus healed a wide variety of diseases. He fed thousands from a few loaves and fishes. He raised several people uh, back to life from the dead. All the while preaching that the kingdom have come. So if the kingdom of heaven has come, it's invaded our world, what would it look like and would we recognize it? Would we see it for what it is? The life and the ministry of Jesus gives us glimpses of a restored world. Just little snapshots, little kind of peeks behind the curtain, the second curtain of the theater. What's going on? People are made physically whole. Relationships are restored. And a community takes place among the followers of Jesus. And that, that is what really demonstrates the most powerfully to the watching world. Not the healings. Um, uh, relationships mean something, but then this community living in a different way really shows Jesus to the world. A community based on love and acceptance because God has loved and accepted these sinners. We see in our passage from Luke 10, we see a pulling back of that inner stage curtain. The second curtain where, where the, the players are moving the scenes. Uh, they're setting up for the next act. It's a preview of God's kingdom. And secondly, uh, what that looks like in the lives of those who follow Jesus. It's a pretty exciting little text here. So what do we see? It's just two points then. A preview of God's kingdom and what that looks like in the lives of those who follow Jesus. What do we see in this preview? First of all, we see that the most ordinary of people are changing the world. Ordinary, common people. How do I know these 72 are ordinary? You know, Jesus was a pretty sharp guy, that's obvious. How do we know that he didn't go around choosing 72 really sharp men? I mean, these guys are going to change the world. Anyone can see that. I've got 72 of them. We actually know. Um, first of all, we know they're not the 12. They're said 72 others were told at the beginning. Uh, the 12 have gone out and done this uh, earlier, have been sent out. Uh, we learn in the verse following our text, in verse 21... Uh, after they've reported joyfully and Jesus has said, this is what I saw and, and this is what you're to be excited about. Not that, but this. He prays and um, praises the Holy Spirit 
praises God the Father, that these things have been revealed to little children. You've kept it um, from the wise and the understanding, but you revealed it to little children. He characterizes these 72 as little children. The contrast is they're not the rich and the powerful. They're not the rulers of society. These are ordinary people. Just common folk. Part of the kingdom of God is that everything in our world gets turned upside down by the kingdom of God. Especially the power structures. What we thought was ruling and changing everything is not necessarily what's going on. The poor and the outsiders of society are brought into prominence in the kingdom of God. They're brought inside. And the powerful and the rich are often left outside. Not always. Like we said, it's encouraging to see the exceptions. Even at one point, the disciples, the twelve, are frightened by this contrast that Jesus makes. And says, if this is true, if, if it's harder to pass through the eye of a needle for a man, uh, for a camel, than for a, man, a rich man in the kingdom of heaven, what's going to become of us? And Jesus simply says, with God all things are possible. Saying salvation itself is an impossibility apart from God's spirit. Now in verse 2, we're given the opening statement of Jesus, which is to be our, our, our basis of interpreting what happens. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then we have this narrative, which is to demonstrate the truth of Jesus' statement. So verse 2 is what you need to go home and memorize. Memorize this, you'll remember the story, uh, but this is the truth statement. When you think about it, it's not what we tend to think about our world. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We live in Victoria. About 10 years ago, Statistics Canada said this is the least churched city in Canada. I mean, almost everyone I know up and down my block, except for one elderly woman, uh, don't go to church. No one among my neighbors. Um, the statistics are something like 5 to 6% of Victoria is supposed to be in church, but I think what's in church on Sunday morning in Victoria is far lower than that percentage. Uh, most of the people that I tend to invite to a Christian event or function or, or to church itself, most of them don't come through the doors. They're often pleasant about it, but they just don't make it. But some of them do. Some of them do. A few years ago, one of our, our young people um, in the community I'm involved in was, was starting to really get serious about his faith and uh, repenting of, of issues in his life and really wanted to stand up for Christ and be recognized as a Christian and uh, walk away from the way he had lived his wife, life and the way his parents lived their life, that he wanted to be different. And uh, he was talking uh, on the ferry coming back from the mainland uh, to someone he just met. It was an attractive young woman. And uh, suddenly he said, oh, I'm going to make sure I identify myself as a Christian. And he blurted out, uh, I'm a Christian, in the middle of the conversation. <laughs> and um, so her response was intriguing. She said, what's a Christian? And he said, uh, I believe in the Bible and I go to church. Just a powerful, pleasant speaker he was. <laughs> And her response was quite uh, remarkable too. She said, what's a Bible? What's a church? And that was a pleasant enough exchange that he did something he had never done before, even though uh, we had encouraged him to. And suddenly he goes, I'll take a step of faith and do what I've been encouraged to all my life. Well, would you like to go to my church? She said, okay. Can I bring a girlfriend? He said, yeah, yeah, everyone's welcome. She came to church on Sunday. She didn't know what a church was or a Bible was. Within a year, she had professed faith in Christ, and she's walking with Him today. And uh, he took notice of that. That wasn't really hard. You know, if, I, if I'm him four years ago saying, I'm not really a good speaker. <laughs> He's a better speaker today. I'm not really conversant at sharing the plan of God and the message of the gospel. I think he could have done a tolerable job, but that's all he had to say at that point. And this girl came to faith. She walked right into the church. All she had to do was be asked. He never asked anybody because he didn't believe anyone would come. But before he left and, and took a job in another part of the country, he'd asked many people to church. 
and most of them came. We tend to recognize some people are going to answer better than others. But before that, he just didn't believe anyone would want to come. I have um, I've noticed in my life that there are some people who, uh, who don't want to hear the gospel or who are offended by it. I've met a few of them who hear the gospel message and say, I don't like that message. I don't like what it says about me. I'm not sure I like how I'm going to interpret what it says about God. Uh, I've met one or two who got angry at the gospel. That's pretty unusual. Most people don't run into people who get angry with the gospel. If you do, it can be quite interesting at times. It might even be, be a pleasant exchange. Um, if, you're, if you're intrigued about sharing the gospel with people and you have fun doing that, then different experiences become fun. But the truth is, only a small percentage of people are offended by the gospel. It seems like the great bulk of them who hear it and hear our message say, that's, that's nice. Would you pass me the salt and pepper? That appears to be the bulk. And yet there's another percentage over here that says, I'm intrigued. Or that is attractive to me. People spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the percentages are. And they just vary all the time. This is called, uh, this percentage over here, it's, it's obviously much more than the percentage that says, I hate your message. Jesus refers to a narrow road and few there be we that find their way. And yet, the Bible also says, it's a great uncountable number. It's a big number. And that percentage just kind of varies by the coming and going of God's Spirit. And we pray that we might see a big number. <clears throat> When you think about it, the gospel is the best news that any person ever heard. It simply says that God has entered our world to repair the damaged relationship between us. Jesus doesn't tell us to get our lives cleaned up. He doesn't say, come back for another interview when you've achieved that degree and you've got a little experience in this field. He says, he's come for sinners. And that was the accusation that was brought against Jesus by, by the, uh, the people and authority of his culture. He eats with sinners. He hangs out with the worst people. How can he have any credibility? He's a drunkard and a glutton. He's eating in people's homes, bad people's homes. <laughs> if you're following Jesus, it's a good chance you'll get accused of the things he got accused of. <laughs> When is the last time you were accused of some of those things? Hanging out with all the wrong people. It could be fun to be accused of such a thing. Yeah, some bad people I'm hanging with, but I love them. Yeah, we ate and drank together last night. So that's, that's the accusation. The difference between people is not the, not the difference between the proportion of good and bad deeds, but it appears to be their willingness to recognize that they are a rebellious sinner before God and to accept it so that they are willing to accept the, the forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ puts every person in the planet on the same field. And that's good news for people who understand that they're sinners. That's bad news for people who think they're better than the crowd. Think about the gospel. Jesus offers forgiveness of sins, new identities as children of God, an inheritance, an adoption, that everything that's mine is yours, even my spirit, that you'll be changed people, that you'll have new desires. And the only people who think of the gospel as bad news are the people who spent time thinking of themselves as better than others. Those are the only people, self-righteous people. So after those three basic responses, people who hate the gospel, people who seem to be indifferent to it, and people who are intrigued and attracted to it, we recognize from verse 2 an astonishing statement. There are many more people in this third category who are attracted and intrigued by the gospel than there are people in their world to give them the message. Do you find that hard to believe living in Victoria today? That's what Jesus says. That's the world. And church planters and missiologists run into that all the time. We run into 20-year-old people and 50-year-old people who say, I've never heard this. All I've ever heard is that I need to behave better. 
I need to do certain things. This is an intriguing person, this Jesus. Um, There are a lot of people who don't have any access to see Christians in the flesh interacting with them and with others to see what this message is. That's the intriguing thing. What does it take to get their lives to rub shoulders with our lives? Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest. Pray this. Do you really believe this is true? There are more people willing to hear the gospel. Yeah, I'll go to church with you. Yeah, I'll read the Bible with you before work for five minutes. I'll do that. I'm intrigued. There are more people willing to do that than have been asked who have had the opportunity to hear. That's a, that's a humbling thing. And you cannot pray that prayer very long in verse 2 before you're willing to be a worker, before you're willing to love the person who sits next to you and work, or you're willing to go uh, drive your neighbor's kids to the soccer matches and start having a community dinner with the soccer moms and dads and kids on Friday nights and say, hey, I like hanging with you guys. I like you. And they're willing to hear the message that you have, or at least some of them are. Secondly, notice some of the distinctions that mark the followers of Jesus in our verses. I'll move a little faster. They are filled with urgency, energy, and joy. First, the urgency. I am very uncomfortable by some of Jesus' instructions. Um, He gives the 72 peculiar set of instructions. They aren't to carry money, a bag, or even sandals. The last one makes me very uncomfortable. I'm not a barefoot kind of guy. Um, Just could never bear walking, especially gravel. Last night at 11.30, I walked out to the trash. And I'm told it's good for you neurologically. Not sandal. I don't understand it. Is that just a second set of sandals? I'm not sure what's going on. But um, people walked around without shoes. Um, They still do in many places. But when you look at it, they're vulnerable. I mean, they're really vulnerable. If they're not received in a town, if it's dark is falling and they're on their third town that day, um, uh, they go, we haven't got any money. We can't buy any bread. We're going to sleep hungry somewhere under a tree. You know, I go, can't I just bring a denarii with you? Just one Jesus, you know, I'll get a, I can get a sandwich the one night that no one's kind to us. No, you go with nothing. So there's this vulnerability and urgency. And they're told not to greet anyone on the way. It doesn't mean be rude. doesn't mean not to say hi. It means the greeting in that day was you stop and you talk. You're from so-and-so. Do you know, Sue, what did you think about the harvest last fall? Did you get rains? We didn't get any rains. And it goes on. That's how people greeted one another. It could go on for a long time. You don't have time for that. You've got a task. I forget the number of, of villages in the area. Um, it was, um, I think it was a couple hundred. I, I remember looking, seeing that. And it would have taken these 36 teams, in my guess, about three days to hit them. Not how long the pen they spent in each village. So we don't know whether this took them three days, five days. But they went off on their mission. People fed them, brought them into their home. Uh, but they, uh, there's an urgency there. You need to get it done. You're not going to get through the villages and get the message through. There's urgency, there is energy, and there is joy. Think about the joy for a minute. These are ordinary people who've lived common, small-town life. We farm, we take care of an animal, we go to town and we trade our eggs in, we do this, I've got enough to buy a new, maybe a new yoke for my oxen next year. I'm really working hard on that the last two years. Anyways, just common people. Has anyone ever been given a more important task or more special opportunity than these 72 ordinary folks? No. They're proclaiming Jesus' words, the words of God, before their nation. They're his ambassadors. Jesus says, if they reject you, they reject me. If they reject me, they're rejecting the God, God my Father. You speak with the authority of God Almighty. Has anyone been so privileged? And they come back, they're filled with joy. We had so much fun. <laughs> Guess what happened? Even the demons are subject to us in your name, Jesus. We had no idea the power you gave us. We healed people. We had power over demons. This is fun. Didn't expect this. I think it's an obvious thing to say. 
um, that they, they never had so much fun in their entire lives. And that's the statement that I've heard from people all over the world. Um, just three weeks ago, I was meeting on, on Saturday night with some people going through a gospel primer who want to form community groups in the fall. And it's awkward on Saturday night, run over there about 7, 7.30 and meet for an hour, and sometimes that ends up being three. Uh, and one of them is a brand new Christian just in the last year. And they made the statement, a uh, fairly uh, young mother, that, um, uh, you know, that, that following Jesus was, was so much fun. So for a moment I just played the devil's advocate and I said, how can you say that? Just last year, you could do anything you felt like. You know, you just live life by what you wanted. She nodded her head. I said, so how could following Jesus be more fun? She just kind of smiled and enjoyed my, my little attack and, and said, you know, all those things just led to pain, whatever I chose. God chooses so much better. God chooses so much better. You know? What are the things that fill your life that Jesus might have something better for? He doesn't come and condemn us and say, this is sin in your life, or this is unnecessary, I'm going to pound you. He just says, I got something better. I got something so much more fun. Come to give that to me. I got something better to give you. Well, I want to redeem that thing. Something perhaps that will place you more in the middle of the lives of unbelievers. What would that be? If I could disappear, what would my temptation be? Because everyone's tempted to disappear, aren't they? Be just to be bobbing on the ocean in my little boat seeking after fish. How could Jesus redeem that? I take unbelievers fishing. It's so much fun. Somehow, I catch so many more fish when I've got an unbeliever in my boat. I don't know why. Um, but I try not to take them just because I want more fish. How, what do you do that God can redeem? Or what might you be doing that you don't need to be doing so that you're free to do something else? God says, I have something really exciting. You're going to enjoy it. It might look frightening to go in these villages, all vulnerable. I'm sending you out like lambs, and there's going to be wolves. You're going to get some, you're going to get some, you know, some marks on you. The wolves are going to pass by. But you're going to have so much fun. You're going to walk with me. I've got better things for you to do with your time. So what's our takeaway? The first one is still the first one. Jesus' interpretation. Pray or beseech the Lord of the harvest for workers. Pray. Pray. Pray for Victoria. Lord, we don't need five or eight church plants. We need 100 new churches. You know, by basic calculations, the un- unchurched population, a church of 100 will reach, touch 2,500 people's lives. We need 100 new churches. Pray for Victoria. Pray for workers. Pray for the Christians who just go to church occasionally to, to, to repent, to get involved with other Christians and to form communities and to love the unbelievers in their lives, be captivated by the gospel. How long since you prayed for workers? The Lord of the harvest. Send out workers. Give us workers. Give us church planters in Victoria. Give us Christians who stand up and aren't afraid to blurt out like that 21-year-old man four years ago. Uh, I'm a Christian. Get into your conversation early. Notice the kind of people Jesus sent out. They're not educated. They're not in from positions of influence. They're called babes. How do we know that God has changed the world mostly through common folk? That's the the proposition I'm making from this text. The world is changed by ordinary common people. There have been a few champions who, who stood against heresy, who protected the church, or turned the corner, your Martin Luther's and, and, and others. But it's been ordinary Christians who have brought the church and the kingdom of God forward. In our lifetimes, we have seen the greatest growth of the Christian church in any place or any time since the first century. In our lifetimes. Do you know where that happened? It happened in China. Do you know how, who brought that about? Ordinary people. How did uh, God make that happen? Communists came to power. Missionaries are out. The pastors go to jail. <laughs> the ones whose heads aren't kept really low. The churches are shut. Churches are pushed into homes and underground. 
It's after that that the church explodes like no time we've seen in 1900 years. It's always been ordinary people who bring the kingdom of God about. Why is it that God wants to use the humblest things? Not the powerful, not the rich, not the hugely gifted speakers. Ordinary people is how God changes the world. And finally, we have Jesus' takeaway on verse 20, from which to interpret our whole passage. The 72 return with joy. They're excited by their power and their experience. Um, Think about what they're feeling. They say, we have real power, like nothing Caesar has, like nothing his armies have, like nothing King Herod thinks he has. The Jewish Sanhedrin who rule our country morally and spiritually... They've got no power like this. They've got nothing. They're, they're full of this and, and in, in a right, right way. It's true. And Jesus doesn't poo-poo that at all. He just goes bigger and better. What you're saying is true and it's good and, and be excited about it. But that's not what you're to be excited about. There's something so much better to be excited about. And there's something more miraculous than that. More miraculous is the fact that you heal people and cast out demons. The really miraculous thing is this, that your names are written in heaven. That's what's to stop you in your tracks. Think about that for a while. If you're a Christian this morning, you need to be reminded that Jesus didn't die for you because you were better than anyone else. Or because you got your degree and got your act cleaned up and got experience in the field and the second interview went better. It's not why who Jesus died for. Jesus came for sinners. Only one category. He didn't differentiate between them. Jesus said that no one can come to him unless the Father draws him. The Bible tells us that we are dead in our sins. And there is nothing more remarkable than that God should have mercy on you or on me. That's the astonishing thing. And when you get that fact... You have more joy than if you can heal your neighbor from her cancer or cast out the demon from her son's life. This is the thing that will fill your life with joy and will free you from the things you think you want to occupy your time and your energy and your heart. Rejoice in this, that your names are written. The really miraculous thing is that you've been brought in the kingdom of God, your sins have been forgiven, you have been called the sons and daughters of God. It's, it's a pure gift. It's God's grace. It's His love. The unimaginable has been given to you. Eternal life, abundant life, and God's favor. What if you don't belong to Jesus? The New Testament writers urge us to make certain of this important fact. The Apostle John says, Dear children, I write these things to you that you may know for certain that you have eternal life. Come to a certainty of that. So you can be free from from nagging doubts. Free from trying to earn his pleasure. Just saying, I have it. I'm his child. I'm forgiven. He loves me. This is where joy and freedom starts. If you're not a Christian, Jesus says to you, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the the free offer of the gospel. That horrendous sinners and even quiet sinners are offered the forgiveness of their sins. The adoption of children to become children of God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We ask that you would give us the freedom and power that comes with the joy of our salvation. That we may live for you with urgency, with energy, with great joy. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.